Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Inspiring and providing real insight to our listeners with every story. Exploring deep stories behind every guest. Please welcome your host, Bo Tiffany. Hi, fellas. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to meet you, Bo. Likewise. I, uh, as we were talking just a little bit before, <clears throat> I was very encouraged to have you on. Um, you have a career uh, helping those that have been uh, victims of abuse. Um, and I'd like to dig into that. But before we do, let's get to know you a little bit. Um, where are you from? I was born in New Jersey. Um, yeah. So that's where I grew up and I lived for a while in um, New York state. And then I moved out to the Southwest and I now live in Taos, New Mexico. Nice. Big family, small family. Um, three children. I have an older brother and a younger sister and my father was a chemist. My mother was a stay at home mom. <laughs> <laughs> so what, piqued your interest early on? What were the first things that you were interested in? You mean as a child or? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to flesh out um, yeah. you know, what led you into the career path that you did. Yeah, I mean, I think what really led me into the career path that I ended up in was um, somewhat actually unknown to me. I really, I had, um, I think some significant abuse in early childhood that got buried. I did not have any memories. I had, what I had was symptoms. So I had like a lot of fears. I had a terrible fear of the dark. Um, I mean, I could not go to bed in the dark. It was just overwhelming for me. And, and that actually lasted into my twenties. Um, and, and I, the other fear I had was of spiders, which I think, you know, I think these are like displaced, you know, when you don't know what you're really afraid of, Sometimes our psyches will put it on something else that we think we could manage, um, whereas you, where you might not be able to manage what actually happened, which was the case for me. So it took me many, many years to actually begin to have memories of what did happen. Um, so I was symptomatic, and I had, I had, um, you know, I, I, I say it this way: I felt like I lived under a dark shadow that I didn't understand which made me feel like there was something wrong with me and that I was different and other and sort of alienated. And that was a very internal experience that I think a lot of people share who have abuse in their background, whether they remember or not. Um, so that was, that was probably the motivation, you know, I was always looking for some kind of help. Um, mm -hmm. And when I grew up, which was, you know, I'm 76 right now. So that it was a different world. Nobody talked about psychotherapy. Nobody talked about abuse. None of this was a conversation at all in the world that I lived in. And so, um, and I was kind of a child of the sixties. I didn't, <clears throat> I wasn't really a hippie, but I was on the fringes of that movement and was really involved in the spirituality of that time. And I turned very strongly to spirituality until I realized at some point, I think I was in my thirties at that point that, um, and I had three children by then <laughs> that, um, that the, 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 there was an emotional issue. I really realized that even spirituality wasn't going to resolve the pain that I was carrying. And I went to therapy for the first time. I think I was 35 and that opened up a whole new world for me. So, and then I'd be, and that was a, I had a, a, a small, my my youngest child was really small at that time, and I decided to go back to graduate school in, in psychology. And that's really where my career was born. Um, it was out of really um, the help that I got and the understanding of myself that was so profound that I got from the world of psychology itself. So that's that might be a long answer to a short question. I don't know. <laughs> No, and um, I think that's amazing because I see a lot of similarity, a lot of similarities between the two of us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have shared some of the things that I've gone through uh, with my guests on previous shows, but I, uh, I grew up an orphan uh, and drifted through the foster care system, which was very difficult. Yeah. Um, had very toxic parents, unfortunately, and uh, even as an adult, trying to reconnect was just not possible. And so 
growing up with a sense of displacement and not knowing where I belong and having to kind of raise myself. And then mm. even though I had a, a tremendous <clears throat> amount of um, abuse for my own childhood, the places that I was then sent to were even sometimes more abusive than where I'd come from. I know. That's and uh, yeah, and so it was interesting because I interviewed my foster brothers um, and all of us bear scars, but in different ways. And one of the things that I did was very similar to you. Um, I was always a, a reader and kind of uh, voracious at that. I read all the time. Uh, we didn't have a, a TV um, and, you know, Nintendo was just coming out in those days. I grew, I was born in 74, so I'm okay. almost 50. Um, and, you know, so we uh, each got into something different, but for me, it was more, um, you know, books and a way of escaping my own reality through reading. Yeah. And um, that transitioned into uh, academic reading. And I was very interested in psychology. I took a lot of psychology, really excelled at it. Um, I found the mind to be fascinating. And, you know, you talked about the changes in psychology, um, you know, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, we had like the Freudian theory and some of these other theories of thought, um, you know, and I always laugh because Freud was a cocaine addict and, you know, he was- I didn't even know that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he had his, he had his um, own yeah. things that he dabbled into, but, you know, it, um, the theory of, of psychology and the theory of, uh, you know, just psychosis and abuse and how that uh, scars and, and can really um, affect someone has broadened its understandings um, over Absolutely. the last hundred years. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, I think the whole the whole way that we now look at our early conditioning and the conditioning that continues as we grow up has everything to do with what we believe about ourselves, our coping mechanisms, how we relate or don't relate to other people, mm -hmm. our ability to bond, um, all of, you know, I could go on with a long, long list. So absolutely, thank God the the whole theories around psychology have changed and grown and we really understand and one of the things i emphasize in my new book america and therapy is the whole um way that we look at our psychology through family dynamics mm -hmm. just absolutely essential so everything you're saying is right on right on yeah go ahead <laughs> you know um can you share some of the most significant insights that you gained with working with abuse survivors and the dysfunctional family dynamics? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's so many, and I try to go into a lot of the most significant ones in detail in my book. So I'll, you know, obviously I can't do all of that right here, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I think first of all, there's some really notable family dynamics. Um, and one of the big ones is denial. There's, there's a, a, there's a, and whether it's overt, whether, you know, I didn't hit you that hard or nothing really happened. Your father really didn't do that. Or, you know, whether it's overt like that, or it's more subtle where your perceptions are denied, your feelings are denied, your distress is denied, or you're blamed for it. So that, um, so that that denial becomes something, you know, that many people like myself internalized so mm -hmm. that I didn't feel like I could trust my own perceptions, mm -hmm. even though I had them and they were really strong. Um, you know, I'd be around certain people and I would get like a creepy vibration, but I didn't know if I could trust it because I thought it was just coming from me. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And so then you're, it sort of disables your ability for many <clears throat> to protect yourself in the future because you've learned to distrust your own perceptions because they were never validated. And right. of course, for an abusive system to continue, those perceptions can't be validated because that's part of what keeps the power dynamic of any abuser um, alive and well. So that denial is a big one. And I think 
one of the beautiful things that happens in a really safe therapeutic container is that you're allowed to really, you're encouraged and allowed and it's supported for you to own your own truth. And, and sometimes that's painful, but there's, and usually it is if you're, if we're talking about abuse, but there's something beautiful about being able to allow, being allowed to express and feel and work through that pain with someone who believes you, um, who doesn't shame you, who supports you to uncover the beautiful person that's underneath all that pain. So that's a big one denial, I would say, um, and for me, so for me, that was a big one, the repression that I internalized because in my family, nothing, there was no overt denial. There was just no acknowledgement. Um, it was very, there was just no acknowledgement. We, we looked like a, a fine family. We looked okay to the outside world. And that's yeah. another form of denial. You know, people look at your family and they think you're just fine. Um, and I have... I had contact with someone recently, an old, old, old friend from elementary school found me on the internet and contacted me. And when I told her my story, she was shocked. You know, like she was like, nobody ever would have guessed that. Nobody yeah. would have known, you know, and of course I didn't know. So <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. But there are, so there are, so that, that sort of segues into another thing. And that is that abusers, um, whether it's overt and intentional or it's more covert, um, they blame their victims for their symptoms. So if you don't thrive well, if you have fears, if you become aggressive or if you turn inward or you, um, you know, whatever it is about you that 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 is a, actually a symptom of the abuse becomes a target for further abuse. Like, even if it's just she's too sensitive, she cries all the time, or, um, you know, he doesn't do well in school, what's wrong with him, or, you know, or it might be something more, more overt, like, why is that kid fighting all the time, instead of looking at, well, why is he? You know, what happened that he has mm -hmm. so much rage that he wants to act out on defenseless other kids on the playground, instead of like labeling him a bad kid. Well, let's get into that a little bit. So sure. um, in my opinion, I think uh, there's limited ways of expression for a child because they haven't developed yet. And, right. and so what you're talking about, these acting outs, is the way that they are able to communicate, but it's up to the parent or teacher or someone that's the parental figure in their life to identify that troubled child and get them some help, in my opinion. Because yeah. it usually A equals B equals C, right? You're absolutely right on. You know, and I think in some places that correlation is beginning to be made, but I don't think it's in enough places yet. I don't think enough people are educated enough to know that there is that correlation. Um, and it's a it's absolutely pivotal because if I if I can segue just for a moment to the national and, and it's really international, but I talk about America because I live in America and um, that's you know that's the audience I'm speaking to right now. But really, these are these are global problems. Um, that that child, let's say the child who becomes aggressive and bullies other children on the playground, is really calling for help for whatever is disturbing them, whatever is distressing them, whatever is hurting them, whatever pain they're carrying that they don't know what else to do with mm -hmm. and may have been role modeled in exactly that way in their home. And the big segue is that the most symptomatic people in our society are the same people. The, the what? Who is the school shooter? Who mm -hmm. is the person that is so disturbed, so disconnected from themselves and from connection to others, that there's an impulse to go harm others. Right. You know, we, we have to ask why, what is, what is causing this level of acting out in our society? And it's not just the school shooter, you know, um, it's sometimes it's people in places of extreme influence and power who are discriminating against whole segments of our population 
um, withholding resources from them, labeling them as bad people without even knowing them, sort of like the school shooter, killing people they don't even know. These are signs of mental illness. And that's really the theme of my book is that we can take what we know from abusive family situations and dynamics and look at our country through that lens. If we really want to have peace, if we really want to have healing, if we really want to bring ourselves back from the edge of war, um, if we really want to, um, you know, if we really want to stop the school shootings, we have to look at the causes. Yeah. Well, that gets me into another question. How do you approach the healing process for individuals and families affected by abuse? And maybe what are some of the most important elements for their recovery? Yeah, I think I think some of the most typically, and I, I would imagine that other therapists would confirm this in their practices, typically the people that you see most often in therapy are not the abusers, they're the victims. Um, for a number of reasons, um, w- partly because it's safer to say that something happened to me in our society than it is to say I hurt someone. Even though most of us have hurt someone somewhere along the line, we're not necessarily someone who has sexually or physically assaulted another person. So there's a little bit more, or there's a lot more permission to be someone who has been acted out on than there it is to come forward and say, I've hurt other people, I need help. Because we have such a, a lens of criminal justice that we're, we're more at, and it's, it's not to say that there aren't people we need to be safe from in our society. There are people who are really not safe to be just in the general population, but they still need to have that lens of treatment because Mm -hmm. their lack of safety came from somewhere. You know, you might not want to put the school shooter back out on the street, but that person has been injured. And we have to know that something caused their violence and disconnection. And if we look through that lens, then we would offer treatment even to people who are incarcerated because we want to stop the cycle of abuse. But going back to your question, so most of the people that we tend to see in therapy that I've seen in therapy are people who have been victimized and who, as a result of their victimization, have not become the perpetrator. They've become someone who is more helpless, more powerless, more easily victimized by other people in the future, future relationships, bosses, um, people in their places of worship even. So those are tend to be more the people that we see in therapy. And that's a good thing. Um, but I just want to highlight that actually the healing needs to be offered to everyone because people who become aggressive and identify with the abuser are most likely um, have been abused themselves. But so, so go ahead, you know, jump in. Yeah. You raise a great point, um, partially. So in the 60s and 70s, there was a really big push to deinstitutionalize a lot of mentally ill people. And it pushed them out back into the public, which now we have, um, I think yeah. there was there was positives and negatives to that. Right. Instead of having a filler, you know, for the people that really needed that managed care, yeah. you know, we forced them into the community and now said, you know, the community can deal with them. Right. Um, and we don't have the resources for that. Um, right. What have you seen over your career? Because it really kind of stretches over that time. And how has that changed and what direction are we going in terms of um, how we handle our mental health in America? Well, you know, I might not be the best person to to answer the full extent of your question, because I really have worked in private practice with individuals who were motivated on their own to come to therapy. And that's really mm. the lens that I've worked with. But it appears that, you know, absolutely what you're saying, I think, has been the case that we stopped funding um, places residential treatment for people who were disturbed. I think 
And I do think there was a lot of lack of information, even in that at that time, that many people who ended up in institutional care actually had been abused and traumatized and they needed that kind of treatment and they weren't really necessarily seen through that lens. Um, and so I don't know that they all got the help that they needed, but I, again, I don't have statistics and I'm, I'm not an authority on that. And with a lot of those people being put out on the street, of course, they couldn't really fend for themselves in a healthy way. Um, and so you just have layer upon layer of dysfunction. You have the dysfunction that caused whatever was going on with them in the first place. You have whatever dysfunction might have happened in a residential setting. And then you have the dysfunction of trying to cope in a world that doesn't want you, doesn't have a place for you, and sees you as other. And I think that's the tragedy of really of mental illness in general, that we tend to think of mental illness as the person's crazy, they're hearing voices, um, you know, they're they're just they're just crazy when a lot of really disturbed people are suffering um, from neglect and abuse and discrimination and poverty, um, all kinds of societal abuse and neglect, as well as family abuse and neglect. And I think what's changing, and I think it's changing slowly, um, but I do think it's changing. And, you know, why I wrote this book is because I want to be part of the change. Mm -hmm. it's that I think more, more and more people, and I don't think it's the, it's the majority of the population yet, but I think more and more people realize the, um, the tentacles that are attached to mental illness and realize that that mental illness is not just the crazy person hearing voices. Mental illness is deep depression, paralyzing anxiety, overwhelming addiction, sexual and physical assault, um, or inability to protect yourself in the future from physical and sexual and other kinds of assault. I think we're getting a broader definition of what mental unwellness, let's call it mental unwellness is, and it's epidemic in our mm -hmm. society. It's you and me. It's the people I know, you know, mm -hmm. who are brushing their teeth in the morning and going to work and, you know, putting their kids on the school bus. It's not derelicts. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all strata of society. It's all ranges of economic possibility, sex, religion, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we are starting to get that. I think we're starting to get it. And I think the push needs to be really great. And so if you're talking about this on your podcast with many people, you're part of that. Mm -hmm. You're part of the awakening of like, let's take a look at what's really happening here and have a really humanistic approach to one another. Mm -hmm. Let's come with compassion, with deep understanding, and with some skills to help heal one another. You hit that right on the head. You know, we've mentioned your books and you've mentioned some of the things in them, but let's spend a little bit of time. Let's, can you give us an overview of the two books that you have published and give us a, a brief introduction to the third one that you have coming? Yeah, um, well, really what happened for me and, you know, and I don't think it's, you know, I have my own like individual brand of what happened for me, but I don't think I'm unusual in the sense that, um, as I said earlier, my quest for healing drove me to a more spiritual direction initially. And it wasn't just that I was interested. I had experiences, even as a kid, that were that just sort of pierced through that dark cloud that I lived in where I felt a connection um, to some kind of, I would just say divine love or deep love through nature. And the other place that I really experienced that was through writing. That was just always my thing. Um, you know, and I think some people might have it through music or through art or through, you know, their love of animals or, you know, it, it can happen in any way. Um, but I think often when people have injury with other human beings, they find their connection outside that realm. They find their connection in their creativity or with animals or with plants or with music, like I said, because mm -hmm. it's safer, actually, 
then human beings have become unsafe. And so we don't necessarily look for that connection with other human beings, or we do, but we're continually drawn to the kind of people that hurt us in the first place. So we don't find it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, go ahead. We're living in a time of artificial intelligence and chatbots and all of that. What do you think the impact is going to be on mental health as a result of that? Is that going to help people's mental health because they have a non-biased someone to talk to you, or is that going to create a disconnect from society? You know, I'm, I really am not the right person to answer that question. I will say this, I have sort of deliberately stayed away from the whole AI thing because I I, I'm not, I, I'm actually not ready to see what it has, what it is about and offer because it frightens me a little bit. Um, and that doesn't, Why? yeah, yeah. Because maybe I'm so humanistic that I, I, I am so invested in repairing our relationships with one another, because I think that's the source of our healing that I've just kind of stayed away from that world. I'm not saying it doesn't have something to offer that's really valuable. And at some point I'll probably invest myself in understanding what it does have to offer. But right now I'm just kind of focused on, really focused on our healing our relationships with one another, because I, my experience personally and my experience as a therapist has shown me that the greatest injuries that we suffer from are the the um, lack of love and belonging and the lack of resources and the lack of um, validation of who we are mm -hmm. and celebration of our diversity that we experience with human beings. And so my investment is in trying to heal that. And I believe that those things can only be healed with other human beings. We have to have a reparative experience with other people to heal. Um, now, I shouldn't say that as an absolute, because I do think that people can have a healing experience through their art, through nature, through animals, um, through self-expression. Um, but there's something even that, you know, um, helps us repair our relationships with other people or our safety with other people. So when people are drawn towards those other components, rather than like a social relationship with an animal or art or some of these other facets. Um, <clears throat> so I understand the, the uh, feeling of safety for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and isolation, especially if you've always been an outcast, might not be so horrible, you know, yeah. um, and it might feel safer and having someone in, you know, disrupts that and, and maybe that's just easier to be alone after a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, but we're meant to be social creatures, aren't we? Yes. So doesn't that create a paradox or a, you know, a is that our yin, yin to yang, or I just feel like there's a conflict there. Why are we like that? I, I think, well, I'm not sure if this is the answer to what you're asking, but I'll say this, that I've worked with many people um, who have found great satisfaction in other realms, in their artwork, in their self-expression, in career success. Um, and it didn't really heal the wound. Mm -hmm. It was a great compensation you know what? And if we have a great compensation and that's the best that anyone gets, fantastic. But it didn't heal the wound because the wound is to love and belonging and connection. And I think that's what you're talking about. And what I want to see and, um, you know, and I know that we're far from this in many ways, but I want to see a world understanding, a, you know, a national understanding, a community understanding, a local understanding, that that should be our greatest priority, repairing our human relations, because people who, um, who feel loved, who feel like they're wanted and they belong, who are provided for, you know, and not, not like we just give you everything, but, you know, we're take, we take care of each other, um, whether it's a living wage or resources for people who really are really have lived in terrible poverty, whatever it is, people who are 
cared for and loved and feel like they belong and they're valued don't want to go out and shoot up a school. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't want to rape. They don't want to, you know, rob a bank. It, it, it's that mental well and emotional well-being that actually makes all of us safe. Mm -hmm. And my my quest is to make that a conversation for a national priority, whether I live to see it or not. Do you think it's a matter of being noticed for those that haven't been noticed? And so they act out in the most egregious way to get that attention, you know, like I find that a lot of it, uh, a lot of people that are committing these, we've brought up school shootings and such a few times, don't always come from a good home. You know, some of them do, some of them, there's, there doesn't seem to be that correlation, but more often than not, I feel like there's a correlation there or at yeah. least um, things that were missed by either the parents or the school and not addressed. And so the child felt like they had to go that extra mile to, you know, is it is it just for that recognition and they just go to the very extreme or is it more of maybe the first person shooter video games, they're, mentally being you know raised in this constant conflict if you will um what types of factors are affecting this increase in school shootings because i mean we've mentioned it a few times and i think you might very well be a good person to give us some insight at mm -hmm. least to that yeah i think i mean i think you you mentioned there some really important factors and, you know, and, and also we are all born with our own wiring, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's a factor as well. You know, some, and, and anybody who's a parent can tell you, you know, that baby from the moment that baby was born, he was just so calm and peaceful. And the other one cried all the time, you know, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. same family. So we are born with our own individual nature and we're all born with our own individual biochemistry and our own brain wiring. But that being said, the part that we as parents, we as friends, we as lovers, we as you know, congressmen, we as business owners, the part that we can be responsible for 100% is the way we nurture each other or not. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with how any individual learns to cope and what they feel about themselves and the path they take in life. And that's the part we can do something about. Um, so yes, I think that there's, I think there's an extraordinary amount of abuse and neglect going on in our society, probably more than the average person realizes, mm -hmm. but as a therapist, you see this, you see people who, like I said, they look like they're functioning well. They had, they were raped when they were four. Um, you know, they were locked out of the house if they cried. You know, terrible things happen behind closed doors in families, mm -hmm. and that that we don't that we don't often acknowledge. And many people feel like they just have to, they just have to show a good face. Mm -hmm. Talk about that because you're not supposed to be a victim. You're supposed to be a thriver. Um, you're supposed to be a survivor, and you're supposed to buck up and you know get over it because it's the past or whatever. Right. All these messages are that are that are don't just necessarily even come from the family while they might come from the family they're societal so there's so much conditioning happening in the in the in our society and this is why i talk about societal abuse in my book because if the influences that young people are getting are it's cool to hate a certain you know somebody wearing a certain religious garb or who has a darker skin or it's cool to put down girls or, you know, call anybody who cries, a, you know, a sissy or a whatever, mm -hmm. um, then these are massive societal influences. And because of the advancement in our technology and social media, you know, these are, this is an, something that's inundating young people today in a way that it wasn't when I grew up. Um, it's very, very different. You know, I do see, um, you know, like, communities when there's a disaster or some, some tragedy within the community, um, people pull together, you know? Um, when there's a food drive that's usually community-based, 
there's such a disconnect with our politics and our community values. And that's why I think we've seen so much via the political realm over the last 10 or 20 years, but especially over the last you know, two, three presidencies. Yeah. Um, and each of them tackle a little bit different issues, but we have really this public pressure for change. Um, you know, the, the majority is really getting attacked by the 1%, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. and the policies and the Trump tactics, for lack of, of better words, um, mm -hmm. and how they, you know, run <laughs> business or just conduct themselves within the community. And I think that says a lot because you know, you have most of the people out there that want, um, you know, the same thing. And, and it's for us to treat each other the same. And, and um, you know, we're the color of skin shouldn't matter these days and freedom of religion and all the things that should be protected by our constitution. Yet, you know, every day we watch the news and we see how our constitutional rights and other rights within the system are consistently eroded yeah. or you know there's people that are taking advantage of things that were you know kind of put in there purposely for them to take advantage of yeah. and so it's um our self-policing is is lacking you know we're we're not we're not really looking out for each other as much as we're looking out for these one percents in terms of political realm of what you see. Most of the news is no, is focused on negative and school shootings. Very rarely are you positively uplifted Absolutely. by a good story. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, when you only have so much time of the day to watch the news and you're always exposed to the negatives of life and society, it starts to shape people in a certain way. I and agree. I think it definitely affects mental health. Um, what kind of insights or, or what thoughts do you have on some of that? Yeah, I mean, I a lot. I think one of the things you're talking about, that I talk about specifically in my book, America in Therapy, is that there uh, is, and I use exactly the word that you use, which is there. there's a massive disconnect between what we all want for ourselves. We want safety. We want to have enough food. We want to have good housing. We want to our children to have a good education and be able to get good paying jobs. We want to be valued as individuals and we want to be loved. We want to be loved at, for who we are. We want to belong. We want our lives to have meaning and purpose um, and often beyond our own individual needs, right? Mm -hmm. And yet what we legislate does not reflect those values at all. Mm -hmm. And what we're being told, and I think what we're being fed and being conditioned to believe is that these are ideological issues. These are political issues. These are the left or the right, you know, standing for whatever. When in fact, through the lens of what I have learned and everything I have seen, these are psychological issues. It, if I do not advocate for you what I want for myself, that is a sign of some kind of mental not well-being. Mm -hmm. It's not a political issue. And the beauty of psychology, and this is, what, and again, one of the big reasons why I've written this book, is that it's not partisan. Psychology is not about who's right and who's wrong. It's not about that. When a couple comes to therapy, we don't sit there in judgment of whose side we're taking. Right. We help people listen deeply to one another, hear each other's pain, make compromises for the good of the relationship or the good of their children or the good of the family. Mm -hmm. We help people grow compassion and deep empathy so that they can actually get along and feel the love they're missing. Why do people come to therapy? Because they don't feel loved. I mean, that's the bottom line cause of human pain is a lack of love, uh, an injury to love, a betrayal of love, 
or a to for some people, a total absence of love. You know, you, you hit something right on the head. Um, you know, I feel like love has to start with yourself, though. You have to learn how to love yourself because if yeah. you don't love yourself, you can't allow someone else to love you. Right. And probably you're not able to love them in a healthy way. Is there steps to recovery for abuse uh, victims that might be listening to this right now and some of this is connecting to them? Yeah, what? absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are things that people can do to grow self-love and that those are, you know, things that we can kind of do ourselves. We can hear our callings. If I'm called to art, then do art. Even if I'm not going to make a living at it, do it in my spare time, feed myself the food that I'm longing for, take care of my body, you know, stay away from people who are hurtful to me. Um, you know, we, there's lots of things that people can do that are self-loving, but I think the, the deep injury to self-love, as I've said, or to loving ourselves, and again, do those things, and they may be good enough, um, but, you know, sort of what I'm advocating is that we become not, not therapists doing therapy for one another, because we won't be. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to be trained psychologically to be kind to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be trained as a therapist to speak respectfully to someone who's upset or who's giving you a hard time. You know what I mean? You, mm -hmm. We have a choice to be mentally healthy ourselves and be loving. And you don't know what that can do for another person who is hurting for a lack of love. So we can spread that love. You know, and another person can pick that up. You know, I know if somebody looks at me with kind of a mean look or they, do, they, you know, they don't have time for me or they have some kind of prejudice against me, you know that you get that from a person's vibration toward you, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, <clears throat> when someone looks at you and they're like, how are you? Tell me about your day. You know, are you having a hard time? You know, I want to hear about but it. They're generally interested. Yeah. Right. We can give that to one another. And there is a profound effect from, you know, spreading that kind of love and connection to one another in our day. I think um, it's that genuine acknowledgement. You know, you just take that right couple minutes, even if it's a few seconds to acknowledge someone, say hi, give them a compliment, yeah. yeah, somehow lift their day up if you can. You know, I, I try to practice that myself as a routine. Yeah. It's the uh, butterfly effect. I like to think of it, you know, and absolutely, it's those small acts of kindness that go the longest distance, it seems. Right. And what if we had that role modeled in Congress where yes. you saw someone, you know, presenting an idea that another person completely disagrees with, but instead of, you know, the, the name calling and the whatever that goes on, the, the extreme divisiveness and hatred and, you know, advocacy for violence in some cases, um, what if we saw a role model for ourselves and our children? Tell me more about why you feel that way. I don't agree. This is what I think, but I'd actually like to understand you better. Mm -hmm. Tell me where you're coming from. Tell me what shaped that opinion going both ways, mm -hmm. right? Going, but what if we had that role modeled? What if we saw that on the news? What if our children saw that on the news? Or what if on the news, when something terrible happens, the commentator says, this is a tragedy. We have to call in mental health experts and people who have worked with, you know, criminal populations and disturbed populations and get to the bottom of this so that as a society, we can heal and prevent this from ever happening again. What if that was the message we heard? Because that's the message that you get in psychotherapy and psychology. So what I'm saying is, yeah, if, what, when you say, what, what do you advocate for people who are trying to heal? Yeah, get professional help if you can, for sure get professional help if you can. But unfortunately, it's not available to a lot of people. 
So vote for people who want to see that be part of our agenda, part of where our national funding gets allocated, where it becomes a priority that we take care of one another. I think what we're seeing right now is a transition from the industrial era into mm -hmm. an age of enlightenment. Yeah. And there's a fight. <clears throat> There's a fight behind the scenes to keep the old ways, you know, and Absolutely. prevent that uh, that evolution, if you will. And change only comes, in my opinion, from my own experiences, when something hurts, whether that's your pocketbook percent. <laughs> or, or, or physically. And that's where we're at these days, in my opinion. That's right. And so, you're, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I was just going to get your, your thoughts on that. Um, I think, you know, your main focus uh, for your upcoming book, American Therapy, is related to some of this. Um, yeah. And what do you think about the social attitudes towards change? Is it enough for the ants to band together and overthrow, you know, a few, if you will, or... And what, what does that look like? How can we do that in a way that's not violent? And, and what's a way that we can do this? I think the baby boomer generation, your generation, trying to figure out this way of, of love, you know? And I think that um, at least right now, because your generation and down, you've taught us, your, you know, your generation had us, my generation, and, you know, so on. We've tried to instill some of these values from your generation, which mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, a generation lasts, what, 20 years-ish. Uh, and so the ideas of our forefathers take a long time to grow out of. Yeah. You know, and I feel like we're finally at this precipice of some new ideas with a community that was built by your generation, you know, with your children, mm -hmm. teaching the teaching these ideals, you know, are we finally close to a spot where we're going to start to see the changeover? You know what I mean? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I, you know, and I don't know the answer because nobody is the Oracle of Delphi here with sure, the, sure. <laughs> in the future. But I, I think you bring up a lot of really good points. And one of them is I see this in my children. You know, they have a totally different consciousness than I had growing up. And, and I think it's really true of a lot of young people. And certainly there are a lot of young people who don't have exposure to the things we're talking about, who are being very conditioned to be very, very partisan, very um, discriminatory and very blaming of others. And that's what they're being taught. And that's what abusive families teach, that your problems are somebody else's fault. And the way to eliminate your problems is to eliminate or hurt or jail or castigate some other population. And that's what I'm trying to point out here. But um, they felt like it was easier, I'm assuming that way, but it's really not because it perpetuates the problem rather at, than dealing with the problem. Yeah. That's well, that's exactly it. Um, however, there's a benefit for people who are in positions of abusive power to perpetuating the problem because they keep their power, just like an abuser in an individual family keeps their power by continuing the abuse and the targeting of certain people as their victims. But going back to the big picture of what you're saying, I do believe that there is a, a, a very strong rising of consciousness of what this is all about. And I think some of the evidence of that, even though it looks you know, highly divisive and controversial in the news, is that there's a great quest for the truth. People really want to know, what did that guy really say? What did they really do behind closed doors? Was the election really you know, defrauded, you know, was it really, um, you know, influenced in a bad way or, or, or did Biden really win or whatever? People want to know the truth. And that is 
the, you know, part of the heart of, of the best therapy and psychology is we have a safe place to delve into our own truth. That's where the healing begins. I can say this happened to me and it was horrible. And I can also say, you know what? I hurt that person too. I acted out on that person who was my employee. I didn't give them the raise they deserve because I projected something onto them because of their sex, because of their race, because they looked insecure the way I felt insecure. We, we can own our stuff. And that's what I want to see for our country. Our country has perpetrated some terrible wrongs on many, 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 many people. What if we could own that? Yeah. What if we could just own it and say, this is part of our healing? like 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 we want for individuals um so one of the things i want to say just real quickly if i can throw no this problem yes yeah. you know a lot of what's happening is being framed as this you know epic battle between good and evil and i don't believe it is i believe that's what keeps war going There'll always be someone we can call evil or wrong or bad or, you know, that we want to take from or whatever it is we want to do. Um, I don't believe that's what's actually happening. I think we're being sold a faulty bill of goods. What's happening is the consciousness of our actual need for one another is rising and I think people whose consciousness are rising, is rising realize that we're actually not going to make it here as the human race unless we embrace our interdependency, not only as Americans, but as global citizens. We depend on Absolutely. everyone to keep this earth habitable. We depend on everyone not to drop the next nuclear weapon. Does that make sense? And I think Absolutely. That, that's... That's where consciousness wants to go. That's where even in an individual who becomes healthier and heals some of their wounds, that's the attitude they start to adopt toward their own family or their friends or the community. We're in this together. Let's work together. Let's make it sustainable for everyone. Let's include everyone. And, you know, those who want to hold on to power by dominating certain populations are opposed to that. And that's the struggle that's going on. Consciousness is rising. And I I don't think it actually can be stopped. I hope to heaven it can't be stopped. Um, and you and me and a million other people are out there trying to be a voice for that. I agree. Um, you know, it's it's amazing. Um, I had some similar thoughts on things. Um, one of my guests talked about uh, loving yourself, scars and all, right? And, you know, owning it. And yeah. I think one of the issues with owning it I, for some people is they think that if I own it, I can't love myself because it's so bad. But you can. You can still love yourself. And if you own it, it it's almost like, shedding that way you own yeah. it yeah. and it somehow yeah. seems to fall off you but it comes through learning to love yourself despite it not judging yourself because of it you know and those right. things and i feel like um you know on a, on a global basis the internet has brought us together and has connected all the worm colonies you know all the ant colonies and so you know, there's a lot of, there's negatives about gaming and this gaming lifestyle uh, that a lot of kids and people are into these days. But one of the cool things about it is you can be playing with somebody in South right. Korea or right. Vietnam, or and right. you can be you know, having fun and creating social connections that mm -hmm. you never would have before. And right. it's brought us together in a way that, you know, so for all the negatives that um, like gaming systems and all that have, have brought, there's something about the uh, bringing together a community that even though the internet, you know, helped bring us together with chat rooms, being able to like play a game with someone from across the world and get mm -hmm. to know them and their family and you develop friendships and I think that's an amazing thing that's bringing globally 
uh, people together in a big way. Um, you talk about the metaverse and that kind of thing. You can only see that being even more, uh, you know, a, a way of bringing people together. But at the same time, we need the balance. Um, and that's, that's the thing I, I think is important, uh, you know, for as much as, as uh, we are great at certain things, we're not balanced as a people. And that balance is what creates that role. And if you're lopsided, then it, it doesn't roll so well. I think, I, I mean, I think that's a fundamental core issue of where we are at and who we are as human beings, which is we have choice. Mm. You know, many animals, they just sort of evolve the way they evolve. And if the prey mm -hmm. is available, they have food. And if it's not, you know, some of them die out and it just, it happens sort of automatically along the lines of whatever the laws of nature are. And human beings uniquely have amazing choice. So we've developed technology and now we have to choose what are the healthy ways to use it. Right. We can, we have that ability. You know, parents have the ability to turn off the TV when what's on it, they don't want their children to watch. You know, and we have bigger choices. What are we putting on the television? What kind of games are we making? What kind of influences do we actually really want out there? And if we're looking at the through the lens of our mental well-being, and really it's all of our safety. And I think that's that's the piece that isn't quite commonly known. You know, anybody's child can be in the elementary school where a shooter goes. Mm -hmm. It's about all of our safety. Our investment in national mental health is for all of us. And I think that's part of what, you know, I and many people like me want to help educate the public to realize. And when you, I wanted to pick up on a theme that you brought up earlier, because I actually have a chapter on this in my book, that pain is the great motivator. And, um, and that is what brings people to therapy. Something isn't working. Even if 10 things are working, their marriage isn't, or they're not getting along with their children, or they can't express their creativity, or they just have, most, most often it's, it's a lack of love in some way, or you know, overwhelming depression and anxiety or addiction that brings people, or rage that brings people to therapy. It's our pain, and our pain in that sense is our friend. And I think we have to realize that, that there's a, there's a positive use for pain because it's a motivation for healing. And we also live in a culture that is teaching us not to show it, that it's a sign of weakness, or that we should find some way to numb it out. And these things do not serve. We need to feel pain as a motivation to heal our nation. We need to feel the pain of our divisiveness. We need to feel the pain of the people who are living, the millions of people who are living in poverty, whose children don't have enough food, don't get medical care, can't get a good education. We need to feel the pain of that to do something about it. And so in that way, you know, and, and again, this is about choice. What are we choosing to do with this? Are we going to numb it out and just blame people for their ills? Or are we going to try to heal? And the, and the principles of good psychotherapy are the principles that we could bring to our nation, which is deep listening to many, many points of view. And, and oh, and you brought up something else. You said, can we do this nonviolently? And one of the things I want to say is we have to do it nonviolently. Violence is one of the causes of where we are. So one of the principles, of course, of good therapy and healing is nonviolence, nonviolence towards oneself and nonviolence towards others. You cannot heal. You cannot be in a, in a, in a, in a therapy session. Let's just take that as the bottom line um, <laughs> and do any kind of healing work if you're being threatened. Mm -hmm. you because all you're going to do, which would be normal, would be to try to defend to survive. And right. that's the country we're living in. People who believe they have to defend to survive rather than sit down and listen to one another with openness and acceptance. And number one, and I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, like I get on my bandwagon is the desire for repair. 
the desire to come back together and really knowing the cost of not doing that and the huge benefit of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of other principles involved, but these are the beginning. Like, like, you know, when a couple comes to therapy, we don't allow them to just sit there and scream, you know, obscenities at each other. We say, if you're really feeling that angry, come and work on the anger or leave the room and come back when you feel like you can have a conversation, be safe, you know, make it safe for your partner to hear you. You have, you, you have a legitimate gripe. You're angry about something. I will help you learn how to express that in a way that you could be heard. You want right. to be, heard. we all want to be heard. Yep. You know, uh, two things that came to mind. I'll start with the second one first. Uh, anger is a secondary emotion. And so violence and anger go hand in hand. You're not right. usually happy and, and creating disaster and terror. Right. Um, so looking at the underlying causes, we always seem to treat the symptom rather than looking at the cause. Exactly. And one of the ways to get to the cause, in my opinion, and I'll, I'll highlight something that I saw on a YouTube clip just to make it fun. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, was talking about how he was so thankful to Mel Gibson uh, because he was down on his luck, couldn't get a movie part. Uh, he had destroyed his career and Mel gave him a chance. Mm. And he said, uh, you know, in order to get better, you have to hug your cactus. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and, love and he said, you know, it's hard to do at first, That's you know, right. but after a while you can learn to hug it. And, and I thought that was powerful. So I'm glad that you loved it too. Oh, I think that's beautiful. I think that's really beautiful. Say more about how you see that playing out. What would it look like to hug your cactus? Because I think that's a really powerful metaphor. For me, I think it's, uh, it's, identifying seeing yourself for who you are rather rather than how you're trying to see yourself i think we often feed ourselves an illusion which is why people often see us different than than who we think we are and so i think you know really identifying you know like am i selfish am i am i giving enough do i live by that golden rule you know i'm i, I sometimes uh religion is difficult. Every, every culture has one to explain those big questions. Who are we? Why are we here? What happens when we die? Who created us kind of thing? And even having that talk of religion is offensive to some people because they're so devout within their religion that you must be wrong. Yeah. And, and so if we can get beyond that, we learn that there's these commonalities within the religion and perhaps none of us are right. And it was our way to explain those big questions and also to create a way for us to live together without killing each other. You know, if, yeah. if evolution is right and we came from cavemen, there was that one guy that was bigger than the other cave guy who has the wife and more food and the big guy's got a club. So he takes the little guy out and takes all of his stuff. That's a repetitive theme throughout history. Yeah. You know, every... Yeah great civilization has had you know that same cycle and i think we're we're at that point where we're also at that same cycle and we have a pinnacle where uh advanced societies will hit this point where they don't get any better and they didn't yeah. decline and they fall apart yeah and i feel like um that's playing out now and we have these big questions that we need to answer and That's part of that is hugging our cactuses. You know, I traveled a lot before um, I had a bad accident. Now I can't travel much, but so I, I was able to see the world and I, I got to get beyond my own backyard. And the thing that I found is that we are so ethnocentric as a culture. And I'm sure it's like that no matter where you go, because it's just like your own home team. You know, we always want to root for our own home. Right. So once you start to open your eyes and realize that you know really we're just on a small rock that is not as big as it used to be you know i mean we're the first in in the whole history of 
of the earth to be able to travel to the other side of the planet within a day you know right. and so we can experience so many more things if we choose to that would culturally enrich us and when we find those connections even the the ones that i was discussing regarding like video games and such we start making these small connections and those grow that's and, right. and that's what i see right now yeah but I, 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 I think one of the issues that we have is is as whether it's political or or cultural or uh, community based, people are having a really tough time hugging the cactus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and so things are getting so bad that it's causing the pain, whether in your financial book or in the environment or in your community, that then you have to do the change. And that's that's right. how I feel what's playing out. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think you brought up so many good points. I probably won't remember them all, but Sorry. <laughs> but, but what I think of when I think of hugging the cactus is, um, you know, like hugging all of myself, you know, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, like I have my strengths, I have my gifts, I have my blind spots. I have the places where I've been less than kind or generous or whatever. And the beauty of hugging the cactus on that level is if I can look at you and say, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I was kind of selfish when I said, blah, blah, mm -hmm. then I've opened the door to you and me reconnecting mm -hmm. part of healing. And that's the beauty of it. It's like, it brings us back into loving connection. If you've had ever had anybody sincerely apologize to you for something that they did, you know how good it feels. Mm -hmm. You know how it opens the door to reconnecting with them, or at least it opens the possibility. You may or may not want to, but right. it really opens the door like nothing else. So we can give that to each other. When we hug our own cactus, we can give that to ourselves. Like, yeah, I'm not perfect. And guess what? None of us are. You know, there's probably not one of us alive on this planet who hasn't hurt somebody in some way, you know, or done something that was selfish or unkind or small-minded or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have to be ashamed of that. That's part of being human. That's part of being hurt. It's going to come out somewhere. Right. And so if we did that, if we looked at that on a national level, look at the repair that we could create, look at the reconnection we could connect, we could create with elements of our own society. Um, oh, and I just want to say like we, the world of men and women and the masculine and feminine needs this so badly, so, so badly. And there are so many people out there who are doing this work, who mm -hmm. are finding the, the feminine in themselves when they're men and empowering the masculine in themselves and finding that balance who are women and bringing that to their human relations. Um, Can I so, say something to that? Please. Not to, Eric, we are masculine based uh, and we should not be, but it's been it's it's been an evolution and i am so glad that the women's movement happened in the 60s and i hope that you were part of that because i can thank you then yeah. um but it's the it, it's this idea of masculinity that sometimes keeps us repressed um the idea of what it is to be a man you know that's we right can't cry we have to live by the stereotype but we are all the same and, and sometimes, um, you know, if you are in touch with yourself or your feelings or emotions, then society might make fun of you, you know, or, you know, they, they frown on that and discourage it. But at the same time, we live in an age where we have a vice president as a female, which thank God that's finally happened. And I can't wait till we have one that is female as a president because women have a way of seeing things that is so needed yeah you know yeah uh, this masculinity yeah. blinds us sometimes to the more empathetic things that we need in order to connect to each other and in, in yeah. order to you know grow as a as a global community yeah um, it shouldn't be about the one of the most toys wins or you know who's got more uh, the most nukes or the most gold or 
Of course. We should have some kind of, you know, Reagan talked about, President Reagan talked about, uh, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if, you know, America or the world was invaded by aliens and how we'd have to, it would be this common thing to bring us together. Um, we have some of those big breakthroughs, you know, internet, things like that, things that are truly starting to bring us together. But it is that globalization, and we need to hug the cactus for that. We need yeah. to hug yeah. our histories. We need to hug our own yeah. transgressions. Mm -hmm. America isn't as great as we present ourselves to be, and a right. lot of other places aren't either. Right. So hugging those cactuses and really starting to grow after that, I think, is where we, we hopefully will get to. Well, I think, I think the real growth can't happen without that because part of healing is taking responsibility for yourself. Yes, I might need to say, you assaulted me. I didn't make you assault me. You are responsible for that. That's also part of healing, to say that without shame, without self-blame. But it's also part of healing to take responsibility for my own actions. And they go together. And that whether that's me as a person, us as a family, America as a country, um, men, women, you know, whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. that is part of healing. And it's an essential part of healing. And it's something that we want to celebrate in one another. You know, like, wow, you were able to say you did that. That took courage. That took strength. You know, good for you for owning that. That makes me feel safer with you. And if there's some amend you have to make or something you have to repay, do it, you know, because that's part of it too. Sometimes we really have to make amends. Sometimes someone needs to make amends to us. And we can say that. We can say there has to be reparation for what was inflicted. Um, these are all parts of psychotherapy. They're all parts of good psychotherapy and healing. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a hundred percent with you on that. I uh, I really thank you for the time that you spent talking with me and us today. Um, I think there's a lot of nuggets that came out in this. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to bring up before I let you go? I'm going to be putting links in the description for your two books that you have, and then. When do you expect a release date for your You know, I'm hoping by next year that my new book, American Therapy, will come out. And I'll let you know as soon as I know, because, okay. uh, you know, I just that, you know, that is my contribution to or, you know, I actually have another book in mind, too. But um, um, that is my big contribution today to to what I hope will become a tipping point where we really understand um, the the dire need we are in as a country, as a human race, to heal ourselves as individuals, as families, as communities, as nations, and as a world population, and the great benefit that we can all have from doing that, and the and the and the consequences of not doing that. And I just wanted to say one quick thing about when you were talking about men and women. You know, in all the years that I've been a therapist, the wounds to men and the wounds to women that I see in my office are exactly the same. They're all from a lack of love, from abusive family dynamics, from terrible messages we've received about ourselves. It's no different for men than it is for women. We've just been conditioned to manifest those wounds differently. And the power over dynamic that men have been taught is part of what we need to heal. And part of the healing comes from women accessing their own power so the healing can come on any level yeah yeah looking forward to seeing that thank you thank you You're so welcome. much for having me give me one second thank you so much for coming on and and i wish you a great day um I'd like to follow up with probably a year or two uh, after your new book is done and maybe we can talk about that some more if you're I would interested love that. I would love that. Thank you so much. And you've been a, a fantastic podcast host. I love sharing with you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, I'll put a link in the description for the two books that you have out currently. And right. then when you get that third one done, I'll shoot that in there as well for anybody. Yeah, and please put my website on there, um, which is 
just my name, www.phyllislevitt.com. And anyone who's interested can sign in for my newsletter and keep updated themselves and just, you know, keep in touch with the progress I'm making on this book. Um, and I just, again, I just really want to thank you so much. Same here. I uh, really enjoyed our talk today. So it's a pleasure to uh, connect with you. You have a great day and uh, enjoy your weekend. We'll talk you again too. soon. This has been Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany, exploring deep stories from real life guests with real life experiences, providing insight to our listeners with every story. Stay up to date on future podcasts by bookmarking Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany.podbean.com and follow Bo on social media by searching Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Have an idea for a future story? Send your idea to acrmadison at gmail.com. Until next time, grab life by the horns and keep inspiring others.